Good afternoon. Welcome to this session of the Washington History Seminar, Historical Perspectives on International and National Affairs. This afternoon, we will focus on a new book uh, by Clemson University scholar Orville Byrne Burton and Charleston Law School of Law scholar Armand Durfner. Congratulations on your book uh, and welcome to the Washington History Seminar. We're also very fortunate to have with us University of Mississippi professor Barbara Phillips and University of Notre Dame pr uh, professor Diane Pinderhues. Uh, who will provide initial comments and begin this afternoon's discussion that we hope will involve many in the audience as well. Uh, Professor Phillips and Pinder Hughes, warm welcome to the Washington History Seminar. I'm Christian Osterman. I direct the Wilson Center's History and Public Policy, History and Public Policy Program, and I have the privilege to co-chair this series with Eric Arneson of the National History Center and George Washington University. Today, Eric will introduce our speakers and moderate the discussion. The Washington History Seminar is a collaborative effort of two organizations, the National History Center of the American Historian, Wilson Center's History and Public Policy Program. For more than a decade, this seminar has served as a nonpartisan forum to discuss important new historical findings, insights, and publications. Prior to the pandemic, we met on a weekly basis at the Wilson Center, but we've been very pleased to come to you via Zoom and Facebook Live now for over a year, and we're delighted that so many more people have been able to participate in these sessions. Behind the scenes, two individuals help produce this event, Rachel Wheatley for the National History Center and Peter Bierstecker for the Wilson Center. Our thanks to both of them. We'd like to acknowledge our supporters and we welcome your support. Details uh, about how to support the seminar are available in the chat function right now or simply go to our institutional websites. We welcome your support. Let me invite you to join us uh, this coming week, this coming Monday, July 12th, for a discussion of Kai Bird's new biography of Jimmy Carter, The Outlier. Before I turn it over to Eric, a couple of technical notes. Today's session will be recorded and will soon appear on our respective organizations' websites. For the Q&A part of this webinar, uh, you have three ways to participate. Our preference is that you use the raise hand function in the Zoom functionality. If you'd like to ask a question, once you press the button, you will be entered into a queue. When the moderator calls on you, you will receive a prompt that will ask you to unmute your screen. Please press yes, and you will, otherwise you will not be able to talk. You can start getting in line even before the discussion period. You can also use the Q&A function at the, in my case, at the top of the Zoom screen to post a question and Eric will put it to our panelists. Uh, and uh, if you're following us, viewing us on Facebook Live, you can email Rachel Wheatley at rwheatley at historians.org. And with that, I turn the Zoom room over to Eric. Eric, all yours. Thank you very much, Christian. I have to say, I am very excited about today's event, uh, in part because of the people we have joining us and in part because of the rather important subject matter of today's book under discussion. Uh, our two authors are Orville Vernon Burton, who is the Matthew Perry Distinguished Chair of History at Clemson University. He is Emeritus University Distinguished Teacher and Scholar at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, uh, where I met him many years ago. Uh, he earned his PhD from Princeton, and he is a prolific author on race relations and voting rights. His book, In My Father's House Are Many Mansions, published in 1985, broke new ground in the study of black and white families. And his prize winning The Age of Lincoln, published in 2007, used President Lincoln as a fulcrum to tell the story of 19th century America. And in 2007, the Illinois State Legislature honored him with a special resolution for his contributions as a scholar, teacher, and citizen of Illinois. His co-author this afternoon, Armin Durfner is also a graduate of Princeton University and Yale Law School, and he's been a civil rights lawyer for more than half a century. 
As part of that work, he helped to shape the Voting Rights Act in a series of major Supreme Court cases and in work with Congress to help draft voting rights and other civil rights laws. He is currently distinguished scholar in constitutional law at Charleston School of Law. And now I will turn the screen over to Vernon and Armand, uh, who will introduce their book and the subject, uh, and then we will turn to our discussants, who I will introduce uh, in a bit. Folks, Zoom room is yours. Well, one of the greatest experiences of my academic career was the year 1988-89, when I was at the Wilson Center, actually working on the age of Lincoln. I had an office at the, in the old Smithsonian Castle where the Wilson Center used to be, supposedly in the very tower room where Lincoln looked out to see what was going on toward Manassas and Bull Run. And my family and I, all of us fell in love, not just with the Wilson Center, but DC as well. When I was there, I was also working on a court case with the Justice Department on voting rights. And so the editor of the Wilson Quarterly asked me, would I write an article on the Voting Rights Act? And I did. I was very proud of it. I sent it in and I got back a unusual response and said, no, everything today is about class. So you have to write about class. Uh, now, at this time in the history profession, everything was about little r republicanism of white yeoman farmers and artisans with the rage at the time. So I tried. I went back. I looked at the Wagner Act uh, in labor history and tried to put the voting right, but I could not do it because as I read it and understand it and am more convinced today than ever, the Voting Rights Act is about democracy and race. And you cannot understand the Voting Rights Act unless you understand that it was designed explicitly because of race and prior race relations. And justice deferred, uh, we try to tell the story of race in a unique way. We try to lay bare the complicity of the court, narrating how we actually got to where we are. Now, this book is not just about cases, it's about people and the choices judges made are all of these, we tried to put them in the political, social, economic, cultural context. We examine the experiences of quote, each race, whatever that is, with the Supreme Court and we analyze race as a concept in the Supreme Court. Now I'm gonna have to look at a quote here to get it right, I don't think I have it exactly memorized. The Virginia judge who convicted the married couple, Richard, and Mildred Lovin of unlawful, what he called miscegnation said, almighty God created the races, white, brown, yellow, melee, and red, and he placed them on separate continents. He therefore ruled that God did not intend for the races to mix. So it's not just black and white, but all the races that judge ruled should not mix. Well, the Supreme Court has dealt with issues involving all of these groups, and so have we in our book. From the 17th century through 2021, Justice Deferred looks at slavery, its aftermath, Jim Crow, the dismantling of Jim Crow, modern day problems. Two centuries of Supreme Court cases carry the story of African Americans and Asians, Latinx, uh, Native Americans, and other groups. The book begins with Native Americans, and actually the last case discussed is Native Americans. We go from Amistad through Plessy v. Ferguson, Kormetsu, Brown v. Board of Education, and the destruction or the beginning of the destruction of the Voting Rights Act in 2013. And we even anticipated the decision last week on Arizona. Discrimination in voting, schools, jobs, housing, Modern demographics all plays a part. The American history of race is still being written today, whether it's affirmative actions or it's voting rights act. Anything else, I would argue the present grows out of the past and it shapes our future. As a historian, we look at change over time. And one of the findings that came out of our research is that for 12 generations, the law of the United States enforced and required white supremacy, white privilege, privileges, let alone, of course, early on segregation. And we've only had two generations where we started to move away and address that harm done to democracy so that 
when we get too depressed about where things are, I think we need to put it in a historical context of how little we have actually, the amount of time we've worked on it. The book forcefully wrestles with complex issues, with consequences of history. We believe it's a moral compass, examining jurisprudence that is far reaching and long lasting and some of which is actually unjustified. Now, the origins of justice deferred actually began with a Supreme Court case, Mobile versus Bolden, where the court in 1980 said that it doesn't matter that the law discriminates, you've got to show that the law was intended to discriminate, an issue of purpose and effect that we devote a whole chapter to, chapter 11 in justice deferred. Now, wits and newspapers joke that what are we going to do? Dig up these legislators and ask them, what did you intend with this law in 1911? But civil rights lawyers actually understood that this was not their job, but this is what historians do. We study motivation and intent of lawmakers. We come to conclusions and we know how to do it. Thus, my life changed as a scholar. I then had my day job of writing about the civil rights movement, the Civil War, the American South. And in addition, at night, I was writing thousands of pages, literally, for minority plaintiffs to document intent and meet those requirements the court set out for winning their cases. So in 1980, I started working with Armand Durfner in cases on behalf of minority plaintiffs. And that began, as Rick said, in Casablanca a beautiful friendship and we've been discussing and arguing about the issues that became this book since 1980. So it was a wonderful opportunity for me when Armin asked me to co-author this book with him. I had thought that all those reports from minority plaintiffs would stay forever, probably on a shelf or even on the floor of some law clerk's office who had read them for the judge. And now I have been able to use at least some of that research in the book. Now, Armin is going to talk about some of the themes in our books and the arts of those themes, uh, including, I hope, the 13th Amendment, which was a powerful machine for freedom for me, especially. It shows what Reconstruction could have been and should have been. So, Armin. Uh, Vernon, I think it sounds like your episode at the Wilson Center in 1988 89 was one of the earliest battles over critical race theory, whatever that is. But uh, you survived it and you're here today. Uh, I think Vernon has shown what we've learned, which is, I think there's no book quite like this. I certainly never found one. And the reason is it could not have been written. I could not have written a book like this as a lawyer or a supposed legal scholar. And I think Vernon nor any other historian could have written it by himself because it took I believe the two disciplines together to come, come together. What we have is a chronicle, not just a chronicle of the history of events in close to four centuries of American history, but a chronicle of doctrine. And the doctrine comes through from the Supreme Court and the Constitution and race theory. Um, and it comes through by itself. There's a unity that's formed over a period of time. Uh, the book goes back to days before slavery, when the first African Americans came to this country, and it really was a time when slavery, as we know it, as we knew it in the 18th and 19th century, did not exist yet. And it goes up to virtually the present. George Floyd plays a starring role in the book. Uh, other events of, of last year and uh, the Arizona case of last week, which is mentioned in our book because we were expecting it. Um, over that period of time, uh, the doctrine speaks to us. The doctrine comes out of uh, the passage of time. And it, it, it works. The passage of time shows doctrine. So for example, I'll just give you an example, jury cases. Um, juries are a central feature of American life and racial history. We have jury cases starting in 1880 and going up to last year, 2020. So there's 140 years of jury cases on various aspects of jury and race. Um, and together they form a, um, a unity of 
doctrine and of history that we wouldn't have been able to see otherwise. You can't just sit down there and say, well, the law of juries has these seven uh, aspects and it goes like this. But as it developed and as the issues change and the decisions change, that was an example of how uh, the, uh, the history and the doctrine played together, uh, as Vernon says, to, to give us the present that has grown out of the past. And we see so many echoes of 100 or 200 years ago in today's doctrines and today's history. Um, in the same way, the book taught us a number of themes that we may not have started with. We're, certainly as writers, we impose some unity, but I think we did very little of that. I think the unity of this book comes from itself, comes from the events themselves. So one of the themes, as Vernon says, is uh, time. Uh, we spent 12 generations, this country spent 12 generations in slavery and Jim Crow. We've had now two generations, barely two generations uh, since the 1960s, since the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act and the end of official segregation of trying to overcome that. Though those, those dates impose reality. You can't overcome in two generations what it took you 12 generations to develop, uh, which teaches us at least a couple of lessons. First of all, it teaches us that the work is not done yet. But by the same token, it teaches us not to be discouraged that the work hasn't been done because the work will progress further. So that was one very important theme, the theme of, of time. Um, a, another theme very important is the 13th Amendment, as Vernon said. 13th Amendment, um, we saw it very, in a very important way as a trumpet of freedom, as one of the senators called it back in the 1860s, a trumpet of freedom that it was not simply a one-time historical event. We see the 13th Amendment as a continuing obligation. Ending slavery didn't just happen one day in 1865. It's a process, again, going back to the 12 generations. You don't overcome that uh, right away. You don't overcome it with one constitutional amendment. It took, well, we, it took us 100 years before we even got started on the process. And so now we've had two generations. But in those two generations since the 1960s, we have to keep remembering the 13th Amendment represents a promise not yet fulfilled that we are still working on the process that began with the, with the ratification of the 13th Amendment. Finally, and perhaps the most important uh, theme is choice. Judges have choices. Everybody has choices, but ju judges particularly have choices. And so we're continually talking in the book about the choices the justices had when they made these decisions. And in a sense, it all boils down to whether it just, how a justice reads particular parts of the Constitution or the laws. So justices today, um, some justices read the First Amendment for as much as it can mean. Others read it for as little as it can mean. Same thing is true with the Second Amendment. Same thing is true for the Reconstruction Amendment and the Civil Rights Law. We have a sentence in the conclusion that I think sums up our view on this. And that is, surely the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, for which a horrible civil war was fought, deserved full measure and full value and to be given the broadest scope rather than decisions that drain them of meaning. And unfortunately, for the uh, 18th, 19th century, uh, the late 19th century, early 20th century, for many of the years after those amendments were adopted, we had a Supreme Court that uniformly, almost, almost entirely uniformly, read those amendments and the civil rights laws for as little as they could mean. The Warren courts then turned that upside down and started reading those amendments and laws for as much as they could mean. And that's how we see a difference between what came before and what came in the days of the Warren court. Not just the Warren court, but frankly, we, we highlight the period, the two decades before the Warren Court, 
led by Chief Justice Charles Evan Keyes, who's a real hero in the book, um, and the time in the late 30s and the 1940s, uh, chapter six, which deals with that, is one of my favorite chapters, because it talks about that time before we got to Brown versus the Board of Education. The world didn't begin with Brown versus the Board. It led, the cases led up to that. So as we saw judge, as we see judges read those laws for the most they can mean rather than the least, that is a, a, a lens through which we see the case. And then frankly, we talk about the time since the Warren Court and our frankly great disappointment because we see the court increasingly having gone back to reading cases for reading these amendments as little documents. I want to add one more thing. Um, it's not all doctrine and theory. Uh, we wrote this book not for lawyers, not for historians, not for teachers. We wrote this book for the general reader. And a lot of people, I'm gratified to say that a lot of people, mostly friends, but maybe not all, have told us that we may have succeeded in that aspect. The first item in the topical index in this book is Hank Aaron. But, and there are stories from beginning to end about real people uh, living real lives. Let me just tell you a couple. Um, one, uh, we know that Brown versus the Board of Education overruled the case of Plessy versus Ferguson that in 1896 said separate but equal is okay. Well, it turns out uh, that a woman named Catherine Brown in the early 1870s, 20 years before Plessy, had a case in which she was put off, she was put out of a, a, a white car, a lady's car, on a train because she was the wrong color. Her case went to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court said, no, separate but equal is not okay. The railroad had said, well, the, the white car and the colored car are equally safe, comfortable, and et cetera. Supreme Court said, that is ridiculous. They said separate but equal is not okay. Well, nobody ever seems to remember that when Plessy versus Ferguson came along. Uh, here's another one. In uh, the middle of the civil rights movement, uh, the Supreme Court had a number of cases in which the Southern states were uh, attacking the NAACP and trying to shut down the litigation arm of the civil rights movement. And the Supreme Court uh, rejected those state attempts one after another, except there came a time in 1962 when the Supreme Court had voted in conference, this is a confidential term, they voted uh, to, uh, to uphold a Virginia law and a Florida law, both of which were very restrictive and either of which could have crippled the civil rights movement. In each case, the Supreme Court had taken tentative votes of five to four against the NAACP and to hold the law. And those cases were about to come down when suddenly uh, in the first five days of April of 1962, one justice on Sunday, April the 1st, suddenly retired with a nervous breakdown. The following Thursday, April 5th, another justice had a massive stroke and what had been a five to four majority, suddenly the majority disappeared. And when President Kennedy appointed new justices, both those cases went the other way. And if you can think of a bullet that was dodged, that was the number one bullet. I just wanna end with one of my favorite episodes. Um, and this involves a woman named Miss Mary Hamilton. I call her Miss Mary Hamilton because that's the essence of the story. Um, she was a, an African American woman who came from Cedar Rapids, Iowa. She went south in the 1960s as a civil rights supporter. She was arrested in Alabama one day. And when she went on trial for, for breach of the peace or parading without a permit or whatever it was, the prosecutor said, Well, now, Mary, where were you when you were? She said, my name is Miss Mary Hamilton. He said, okay, Mary, when did you? She said, I will not answer any questions until I am addressed properly. My name is Miss Mary Hamilton, not Mary. Uh, the judge said, answer the question. When she said she wouldn't do it, she was fined $50 and given a sentence of 10 days. People are held in contempt in American courts for little or big things, thousands of times, all the time. 
This case went to the U.S. Supreme Court, which doesn't usually take uh, 10-day sentences or $50 fines. But the court in 1964 was the kind of court that could recognize how significant the issue of courtesy titles it was really anybody who's ever lived in the South knew that courtesy titles were the backbone of the authoritarian and totalitarian system that was segregation. And the Supreme Court reversed that case. And so Miss Mary Hamilton uh, is one, one of the stars of this book. And if you look in the book, you'll see a beautiful picture of her. And true to the episode, she's wearing beautiful pearls. My wife, who's an expert on the subject, says those pearls are really good. So Miss Mary Hamilton, this book is really dedicated to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's a lovely picture and it's a short but powerful story. And you conclude by saying, um, in light of the history and reality of Jim Crow, this small case expressed the meaning of freedom and the Supreme Court's understanding of that meaning. Uh, the book is full of examples, many familiar, many not. Um, uh, and they are woven together, I think, really quite, quite powerfully. We'll now move on to our two discussants, but I will first say uh, to those of you who are watching, uh, you can get ready to ask questions uh, if you wish uh, by getting in the queue with the raise hand function. Uh, we already have someone there, uh, or you can use the Q&A function. We have several people who have already posted questions there as well. Uh, so feel free to get in line um, uh, and we will call on as many people as we can. Barbara Y. Phillips received her JD from Northwestern University School of Law and her JSM from Stanford Law School. She's a former program officer in the Human Rights Unit of the Ford Foundation. And prior to joining the foundation, she was an associate professor of law at the University of Mississippi School of Law, a Spaith fellow at Stanford Law School, a partner in the San Francisco law firm of Rosen and Phillips, and staff attorney with the Voting Rights Project of the National Lawyers Committee for civil rights under law. She's a member of the board of directors of the Women's Environment and Development Organization. She lives in Oxford, Mississippi and serves on its Commission on Police Transparency. Uh, recently, she has taught a seminar on political and civil rights at the University of Mississippi School of Law. Barbara, the Zoom room is all yours. Thank you. It's good to be with you. Um... I'm really happy that the Woodrow Wilson Center um, has included this important book for a conversation. I think it's a book necessary for strategic thinking about today's multiple challenges to racial justice and democracy. Justice Deferred covers 200 cases of the Supreme Court about race and equality. The latest one decided just last year. Yet this is not a book written, as Armand has mentioned. It's not written for an audience of judges, lawyers, and law students, although I hope they all read it. Um, this is a book about what every citizen should know. Armand and Vernon tell us about courageous people who assert their rights, the lawyers who represent them, the judges who decide these cases, and what it all means to our country's history, its present, and future. They're great stories, well told. We are introduced to Cornelius J. Jones, a black attorney in Issaquina County, Mississippi, who makes three trips to the Supreme Court in the 1890s, fighting sentences imposed upon his black clients by all white juries. We get to know Reverend Delane of South Carolina, who was fired from his teaching job and his family home burned in 1951 for pursuing school desegregation. We discover the communities from which plaintiffs arise. And Armand has just mentioned my favorite story too about Miss Mary Hamilton. And I'm glad you showed that lovely picture of her in her pearls. Uh, the book shows how citizen activism, the Congress executive branch and federal courts all interact across time on issues of racial justice. This is a book making the case for what our constitution ought to be while showing us what Supreme Court justices interpret it to be in particular moments of our history. The book got my focused attention in stating, quote, the spirit of the 13th amendment is at the heart of the constitution. That spirit animates this book. 
The 13th Amendment together with the 14th and 15th are together known as the Civil War Amendments, passed after that war and intended to restructure the relationship between the states and the federal government, a new founding of the United States, and to ensure that the persons newly freed from enslavement and all black people were included in that phrase, we the people, preamble to the Constitution. Now, when I was in law school, the 13th Amendment was barely mentioned. It was relegated to history, sort of a one and done amendment that freed enslaved folks. But this book, as Armand says, insists that the 13th Amendment is fundamental to the redirection of our country's future. This amendment is not a one-time historical event that became irrelevant once the institution of slavery no longer existed. Rather, Justice Deferred asserts that the 13th Amendment continues its promise to end the badges and incidents of slavery root and branch to guarantee equality and ultimately to end discrimination and eliminate racial prejudice. An important theme throughout this book, again, as Armand mentioned in his remarks, is the notion that judges have choices. And the question is whether a judge reads particular constitutional amendments and laws for the most they can be or the least. The book presents this theme as an important guide to understanding the decisions of the court. Sometimes we see the court reducing all three Civil War amendments and all of Congress's major civil rights laws to mean as little as they could conceivably mean for racial justice. But the book also shows how simultaneously the court expands the 14th Amendment into a powerful weapon for business and white plaintiffs. Judge John Minor Wisdom, one of the great judges of the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals brought to life by Jack Bass's in his book, Unlikely Heroes said in 1984, the constitution is race conscious. Under the 13th Amendment, the Constitution contemplates and the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment does not prohibit race-conscious, class-based prospective relief. That understanding of the 13th and 14th Amendment seems to be totally dismissed by today's Supreme Court and lower courts. Just recently, we see white plaintiffs use the 14th Amendment to block efforts by the Biden administration to redress past racial discrimination through special funding for minority businesses and black farmers. Just last week, the Supreme Court took a sledgehammer to what precious little remains of the vitality of the Voting Rights Act, finding that discriminatory restrictions on voting in Arizona are just fine. The dissent of Justice Kagan echoed the book's theme about the choices judges justices make. She noted that Congress intended the Voting Rights Act to be ambitious in both goal and scope to end discrimination in voting and ensure the right to participate fully and equally in the political process. She then says, quote, the majority fears that section two is too radical, that it will invalidate too many state voting laws. Wherever it can, the majority gives a cramped reading to broad language, and then it uses that reading to uphold two election laws that discriminate against minority voters. So we now have a Supreme Court fearing too much justice. Quite a contrast to the first time the Supreme Court considered the constitutionality of the Voting Rights Act after its passage in 1965, and approved its provisions, recognizing that the vote is the most effective way to secure equality of treatment and rights. In 2013, the Supreme Court struck down Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act as unconstitutional. And within hours of that decision, the floodgates opened as Republican-controlled state governments moved quickly, passing laws to suppress minority voters with voter identification laws and other measures such as making it a crime to provide food and water to voters standing in line waiting to vote. Just a few years ago, the court threw up its hands and asked Jesus to take the wheel, finding itself incapable 
of remedying extreme partisan gerrymandering, though acknowledging the practice violates the Constitution. We seem to be on a march back to the 19th century. Just as the Supreme Court participated in destruction of the first reconstruction, what white supremacists called redemption, we seem to be witnessing the court's participation in destruction of what has been called the second reconstruction following the 1954 decision of Brown versus Board of Education. White folks have a national amnesia about the role government and law have played in ensuring our dual society, one America for whites and another one for blacks and everybody else. Among the well substantiated arguments in this book is that this country has a long history of affirmative action for white people. I wish everyone would become acquainted with this powerful story. We're now seeing the rise of a new state's rights versus federal government in rhetoric within the Republican Party among white supremacists and in Supreme Court decisions. Uh, the book helps us locate this phenomenon in history and ideology. And now I'll, I'll turn to a few questions. Um, I see in last week's Supreme Court decision a perfect example of the theme of justices reading laws for the most they can be or the least. What's the future of the Voting Rights Act and other laws enforcing the Civil War amendments in view of last week's decision? Are we witnessing the redemption of the Second Reconstruction and our ret country's return to the disgraceful 12 generations of white supremacy while we've had barely, as you mentioned, two generations since legal segregation? Uh, injustice deferred, uh, your response to the problematic qualified immunity for persons operating on behalf of the state is to propose a change in policy that would hold cities and states liable for the actions of their employees. I think this is a valuable contribution to discussions about policy changes that could make a difference. Would you explain the merits of your policy proposal? Should those who believe in racial justice and democracy support expansion of the Supreme Court? Is your book depressing? I was in Square Books picking up the Sunday New York Times and, and promoting your book, which is there on the front table, when a friend asked me whether your book is depressing. So I, I, I've got my own opinion, but I'm, gonna, I'm asking you. And uh, finally, I have two questions that, that do call for speculation. In Brown versus Board of Education, the court famously said this about black children. To separate them from others of similar age and qualification solely because of their race generates a feeling of inferiority as to their status in the community that may affect their hearts and minds in a way unlikely ever to be undone. What might have resulted if the court had also noted that the consequences of legal segregation for white children generates a feeling of superiority as to their status in the community that may affect their hearts and minds in a way unlikely ever to be undone? Aren't we dealing with that consequence, white supremacy today? And secondly, Will we be celebrating a Supreme Court victory for democracy and racial justice before Armand, you, Vernon, and I die? That's it. All right. Thank you so much. Vernon and Armand, there's a lot to discuss. Take it away. Vernon? Okay. Well, I think, well, you are muted. I'll go ahead. And I got. It. I've got it now, Armin. Let me. Okay. Uh, before we die, right? Uh, get yeah. To it. Uh, on the voting rights act, let me start there. And I have a lot of things, and I know Armin will as well. I had thought Diane, and we'd answer all questions, so I kept it on mute there for a while. Uh, I talked about meeting Armin in night. 
1880 because of Mobile versus Bolden. Well, Armand was the person in charge of the renewal of the Voting Rights Act through Congress. And this is important. We discussed this in, in our book. There are three branches of government and people seem to have forgot that. And each has roles and can counterbalance. It's deja vu, as they say, all over again in terms of the Voting Rights Act and the Arizona case reminds, and of course the 2013 decision, very much of where we were in, uh, in 1980. And Armand is a person who was a point person on getting Congress to renew the Voting Rights Act to say that these laws no longer needed to show that there was purpose. Now it's changed over time, but Congress stepped up in a major bipartisan way. And that's the big change and the big difference I think there with well, Congress. and that I, happened under Ronald Reagan. That's right. And though he opposed it, he called it uh, what was the word he used? It was in the article I wrote that never published. But he, uh, the jewel, the jewel, I believe he said of American democracy. Uh, so where have we come? And it was bipartisan, and issues of democracy certainly should be uh, that. I. I've told the story before that the first time I testified in Texas in 2013, I had never heard a judge identify themselves in a political party. This judge did. And I'd been warned, in fact, by a Justice Department lawyer to not take it personally that this judge hated expert witnesses and just try to get off the stand. He just berated it. Instead, he seemed to take a liking to me, invited my wife and me and five kids to ride horses on his ranch in Texas. And he turned to me and he said, Dr. Burton, what are we gonna do? You know, young people don't vote. How can we have a democracy if young people don't vote? What are we going to do? And so then when I was back testifying on the, uh, on the uh, 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 in-person voter ID, I said, the last time I testified in this court, I was being asked by a judge who identified himself as a Republican how are we gonna get people to vote? And now I'm here trying to understand why you are trying to stop people from voting. And I tried to explain, I think what happened. And part of this is demographics in the book. Texas discovered and all of America that we are moving, Texas already has into a majority minority population. The election of Obama, instead of becoming a post-racial society as all the newspapers claimed it would be, it actually showed that when African-Americans and minorities had a candidate who they thought they could identify with and relate to, registered more and came out to vote more. And those kind of things came together with this horrible economic depression at the time, I think, to, to set all this up. But Congress needs to step up once again. Very quickly, I'll move on. I know Armin has a lot of things to say about this. But uh, in the age of Lincoln, I argued very strongly that as a person of faith, the word redemption shows just how masterful the people who craft these sort of narratives of our history use language. So they take a beautiful religious term to literally describe the overthrow of an interracial elected, lawfully elected government coup d'etat in the United States and claim that word. And we're you seeing the use of these words again, words are so powerful. And the side that unfortunately for me that I don't think should be doing what it is doing is are masterful at taking these words and, and, and making that the, the agenda. I, and I, I want to answer all, but let me talk about is the book depressing because I take great, this is what we were doing and we did not know Amanda Gorman was gonna become famous when we wrote this. Uh, in 1951, this is the last paragraphs of the book and I'm just gonna read it if I can take that time. And Eric, if not, stop me, but then I'll be quiet. Uh, in, 19, in the 1951 poem, the Harlem Renaissance bard Langston Hughes asked, what happens to a dream deferred? History shaped by the court's unfolding interpretations and limitations on rights tells us that justice has been deferred too long. Abraham Lincoln challenged us, determine that the thing can and shall be done and then we shall find a way. We take inspiration from the young people who will be writing the next chapter. 
in 2019, 2020, the youth, U.S. Youth Poet Laureate Amanda Gorman gave readings uh, around the century of a poem she had been commissioned to write for Independence Day. In her performance at the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, Gorman, an African-American woman from Los Angeles who was a student at Harvard, explained that she sees American democracy not as something that's broken, but as something that's unfinished. Rather than falling prey to discouragement, she speaks of being audacious and taking up the mantle of our founders and playing her role in finishing their work in her poem, Believers Hymn for Their Republic, she declares, every day we write the future together. And I believe that sincerely, but I think we have to. When Barbara talked about going back to the second, uh, what terms I do not like to use of Jim Crow and the second unraveling of reconstruction, the first one rather, what I discovered was it was not most people who belong to the Ku Klux Klan or most people who belong to even citizens groups in this second reconstruction of the civil rights movement. What really made a difference were good people who did nothing. If you set back, what can we do? Well, we've got to do something. And one of the things we can do is make Congress liable and act and also to explain these words as historians, to explain how people are misusing words to capture people's imagination, to take them to vote against their own interest. Well, that's enough. I'll just echo what Vernon says. I was watching a movie last night about the Battle of Britain and things could not have been darker for England in 1940, 41. Uh, and somehow the people came through, the country came through. And I have to think our country will come through. These now seem like dark days because not only the Supreme Court, but our political system, we seem to have so many people who are ready to throw our democracy under the bus and ready to change the rules and do anything they can to make sure that the people don't count. Um, I have to believe that there's more people who want democracy to count. And frankly, more people coming to this country every year and becoming citizens every year. A million people a year come to this country and almost a million new, new citizens come. And I have to believe that like Britain in its darkest days, like America in days after Pearl Harbor and the Depression, somehow we will survive. And I'll go along with um, Amanda um, and her, her confidence or her hope. I'll just go along with that. So I think we will come through. I'm not sure how it will happen, but I have to believe we will come through. Armin, speak on the Voting Rights Act because you have been central to the Voting Rights Act. I've heard you described as, as you know, the intellectual, the Voting Rights Act, and all of these things. And uh, it's a little embarrassing to say, but Armin knows it. I've actually done a PowerPoint well before we started this book. Is one of my heroes of well, all the things he's done. Is Barbara I may not be the right person to talk about this. I, I, helped, um, uh, I helped forge Section 5 in its earliest days and it went down the drain in 2013. And I helped forge section two in the Reagan administration and it went down the drain last week. So I may not be the best, um, the best person to look, but it seems to me Congress needs to act. As you said earlier, those of us of a certain age remember the Warren Court, a time when the Supreme Court led the way. Uh, in a democracy, we can hope that the court, that the courts will protect the democracy and protect the people, we cannot expect the court to lead the way. That's Congress's job. And our job is to light a fire under Congress and a light, light a fire under uh, the president, the, the political branches of the government and light a fire so that they can do something that the courts cannot undo. And that's what we have to do now. But Armin, I think it's worth pointing out, as we did in our book, that the first 2013 ruling was based on either a deliberate or a mistake of reading the doctrine and things. 
And I actually believe that this Arizona case, that section two is still there. I mean, I, yeah. I agree that once again, though, it's, mis, it's been mis totally interpreted. I'll, uh, I'll take a second and, and just talk about something pretty inside baseball. Um, in the, the Supreme Court of nowadays likes to say that cases involving claims of discriminatory effect don't really count. All that counts is, is a claim of discriminatory purpose. And yet this same court twice in years up, twice in the last three years coming up to last week, um, turned the law of discriminatory purpose upside down. Last week was the third time in three years that this court has ignored its own rule that makes proving discriminatory purpose possible. And so what this court has said now is discriminatory purpose is almost as hard to prove as discriminatory effect. And so this court has now three times in three years um, basically thrown minority plaintiffs under the bus when they are trying to prove a claim that this court says but doesn't do, uh, says it respects but doesn't really respect. And somebody earlier mentioned federal and state. Uh, and when Justice Roberts in 2013 read his opinion, he left out a central uh, part to misinterpret what the Warren court had said, uh, which said just the opposite. And uh, that's documented in the book. I don't know if I can do it by heart, Armin, you might. Yeah, don't, don't bother doing it. It's just that in chapter 10, we talk, we, we give the quotation that, that the chief justice claimed to be quoting, and then we give his, and we have brackets and dots to show how he twisted and misquoted the quotation he said he was quoting. Okay. Well, we're, we're back to nullification, basically, um, which is which is uh, interesting. And I, I put out in the chat, we have a website. We tried to put up the cases. As, uh, the notes were longer than the book. Uh, the press insisted they'd be shorter than the book. So there's a lot more notes and discussion uh, on our web page, and, and that's in the chat room if people want to see where the web page that we've developed that goes with it and are continuing to develop. We're still working on it. But you can actually look at those cases. The URL is in the chat. So uh, we uh, urge people to uh, uh, go to it uh, if you wish to pursue this uh, further. Uh, thank you all. Diane. What's that? I want to hear from Diane. Yes. That's exactly where we're going next. Uh, our second discussion today is Diane Pinderhues, a Notre Dame Presidential Faculty Fellow and Professor in the Department of Africana Studies and the Department of Political Science. She's also a faculty fellow at the Kellogg Institute and is a research fellow uh, at the G in Gender uh, Studies at the University of Notre Dame. Her publications include Uneven Roads, an Introduction to U.S. Racial and Ethnic Politics, co-authored and published in 2014, A Race and Ethnicity in Chicago Politics, A Reexamination of Pluralist Theory, 1987, uh, A Black Politics After the Civil Rights Revolution, Collected Essays, a book that is forthcoming, uh, gender, Race, Gender, and the Changing Face of Political Leadership in the 21st Century America, also co-authored and forthcoming. She too has been a fellow at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars, in this one case, back in 2003 and 2004. Diane, the Zoom room is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. And um, thank you, Vernon and, and Armand, um, Barbara as well. Uh, I'm very honored to be here today. Um, this has brought me back to um, some earlier stages in my life and career, my own research, and I'm happy to be able to offer some comments. And there'll be Comments that will offer a context for the research that you've produced, the book that you've produced. Quite a, quite an accomplishment. Um, and by context, I want to, you know, I just started thinking about the various <clears throat> books that I've known and used for many decades that came out of the group that Armin worked with. So I'm going to show my beleaguered copy of Minority Vote Dilution, the work that you were doing when. Um, I first came aware of the work of the coalition um, 
the Leadership Conference on Civil Rights, the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights, Armin's work, uh, the Joint Center's work, uh, and bringing a whole network of attorneys, uh, voting Southern voting rights attorneys, Barbara was part of that group, who'd come to Washington to um, work at reframing the Voting Rights Act after, after decades of working in the field and making sure that minority vote dilution was not part of the extension of the, of the, of the act. I appeared because I wanted to look at what um, civil rights groups were doing in Washington. And at, at that time, I happened to have a leave. And um, when I began to follow them around and go to the hearings, this is what they were working on. Um, and was things that are still, or now the Supreme Court is bringing back into place into focus the intent versus effect issues where all the, all the point of discussion in the, in the hearings for the 82 extension. Um, so that's one of the books that I, I make use of. Um, this was uh, produced by the Joint Center, the Howard University Press published it. Armand was one of the contributors to that book um, and was a major part of it. Another um, one is the Frank Parker's Black Votes Count, um, a very well-known uh, attorney who worked in Mississippi at the Lawyers Committee. Barbara was one of his colleagues there. Um, he also, and this was his, 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 the book was written when he was at the Joint Center for Political and Economic Studies. I didn't plan to make this a Joint Center praise, but I have to because when, once I got them all out and thought about it, I realized, yeah, important, powerful contributions. The conception of, of um, uh, creating uh, majority voting districts was something that Frank pushed into the uh, the Washington um, uh, group uh, and uh, it's become controversial, but it's nevertheless an important contribution. I This is not necessarily the same cohort, but I wanted to make use of the um, Alex Willingham's um, group of scholars, which published Beyond the Color Line um, on voting rights issues in 2002 from the Brenner Senate Center and then my, my political science colleague, Linda Faye Williams, uh, The Constraint of Race on Legacies of White Skin Privilege, which looks at policies that were created and developed after the Civil War and that framed um, the nation's understanding of what social policy was and that it was, um, uh, it, it, it meant one thing for black people, it meant something quite different for whites. The, the subtitle, Legacies of White Skin Privilege tells you her point. Um, so Armand and Barbara I met in the early 1980s in DC with the Voting Rights Coalition. Vernon I didn't meet until a little bit after that when I moved to the University of Illinois in 84 or so, 85. Uh, we eventually became neighbors. I mean literally, you know, half block from each other neighbors. Um, and um, But it took a while before I think I knew of your work in terms of voting rights. My own work, um, Eric mentioned Uneven Roads, which was US racial and ethnic politics that I did with Tasha, Tony Travis and Louis Scipio about racial and ethnic groups and the voting rights issues were very much part of that, are very much part of that book, which has been reissued. Um, my own work, which I started out doing this study of voting rights issues and I'm, you know, Armin, this is something you will understand. I'm still working on it. Um, hope to publish it someday, but one was a recent publication was the D Detroit Library, which produced this in, in 2020 uh, for their African American book list, the African Americans in US politics, 150 years, which they asked me to do a, and I followed their guidance, Vernon, you know, tracking all of the members of, of the US Congress who are black who were elected between 1870 and the present, um, given that it was 150 years. Now, as we were preparing for this, I heard some communication from um, Armand that I had to quote. I went back to my email and found it. He said, and this was very powerful, when we were younger, I didn't know that some wars never end. And I assumed in my earlier 
decades of life, and we're talking the early 19, the early 1980s, so 40 years ago, when the voting rights extension was coalition was going on, I got to Washington study, began to follow them around. You know, I assumed that things would go in an improved fashion, would go up. It never occurred to me, you know, 20 or 30 or 40 years later, we'd be struggling to sustain what was done, what had already been accomplished by 1980 and was accomplished in the 82 extension, which was minority vote dilution was incorporated. Um, and 10 years later, uh, the uh, right to vote and voter registration was incorporated in a, in a more aggressive way, even though that it took until from 82 to 92 to incorporate the uh, extension of, of um, uh, language minority voting, uh, where uh, Latino and other language minorities were incorporated into the legislation and that was extended, but the, the one thing that the Reagan administration was successful in doing was splitting that element of um, the legislation where the section five was continued, but not the minority language provisions. That didn't, wasn't reaffirmed until 1992. Um, so um, let's see. What I'll say now is that, as you can tell from the oral presentation, this work comes from a, a book of remarkable depth and complexity about the American racial law and its legal status. And I like the introduction that Vernon gave in talking about it's more than just legal, it's more than just historical. It's intended to be a book that the average public can read and understand. Um, I, um, having read their work and work of others for many years, having been a scholar of what I consider to be my effort at understanding and coming to some definitive um, explanation of uh, exploration of racial and ethnic politics of voting rights issues, which I've not finished as I've said. Um, I find once again, uh, and, and the discussion has helped us see a way of, of a good way of looking at this, the Amanda Gorman seeing um, uh, that democracy is, is still in development. Um, Barbara's question about, is this a depression book is a fair question, but it's also kind of every day I look at the paper or I look at online, activities or look at the, the news, I am quite depressed and just kind of go, oh, oh, I don't think I can handle this. But um, there's really no end to the effort at understanding the racial dimensions of American public life. There's no end to it. And what I mean by say that is as much as I've studied this over many decades, and it's been many decades, as much as all of you have published and worked on it, um, your own book affirms that issue, that there's so much to understand that um, Armin's work starting in the 1980s, which probably wasn't starting and it's just when I became aware of it, um, your own work, um, Vernon. The book brings a, a, a very important new um, perspective on this. You would hope at some point that you'd understand it and it would be possible to put a frame around it that seems not to be the case. It's that you've got to kind of keep going at it, come at it from another direction, use the law, use history, use political science, use gender, uh, use um, your introduction about starting with Native American law. As I've sought to teach uh, my course on introduction to US racial and ethnic politics and to come at the status of blacks, Latinos, Asians, Native Americans and whites you end up having to say to students, you know, some of this doesn't really make sense. For example, when I talk about the Native American law, how the court, um, their legislation or their standing in American law is that they are sovereign. But there are also much legislation of Supreme Court decisions that declares them not 
Native Americans not sovereign. And both of those things exist in the law and they, however contradictory they are, you have to take both of them into account. Oh, I forgot to plug my thing in, hold on. Sorry about that. You have to take both of them into account. Um, what one thinks is a path towards freedom um, and arc towards justice, um, that the remarkable challenging political mobilizations in the 20th century, the litigation, the voting rights litigation that Armin and Barbara were engaged in, that Vernon testified about the legislation that was enacted in terms of extending the Voting Rights Act and other uh, civil rights legislation, the political protest or mobilization in the 50s and the 60s, and now the 90s and now the 2000s, uh, 2021, the administrative reforms that this would create a stable um, policy and environment for dealing with these issues. But here we're going, here we go again, um, still leading back towards um, a much more conservative court where, you know, the six to three um, voting results are happened significantly. The, the Times supplement that included um, the visual representation of the court uh, in this term, not all of the cases, but a number of them. The, um, you know, teaching at Notre Dame, the interesting um, balance of Catholics um, versus others are now they're there and they exert a powerful influence. Um, so the, the expectation that there'd be a stable political policy in which civil rights and representation would be part of our society. Um, your, your book is, lays it out in a way that um, I will be reading for some time to understand how this has happened and why it's happened. Um, so I do have a comment, uh, one comment um, in which you say that an important element to know is that, um, let me get to my page. Um, in talking about the post-Civil War era, efforts to provide economic opportunity faltered. Um, the, the power flow, but the previous flaw, um, but overall the various measures of um, four million freed people, you know, I can't read my writing, um, on an uncertain path towards full citizenship. So the point I'm making is the efforts to provide economic opportunities faltered. Um, that was a serious flaw in the effort to reform in the post-Civil War era. But overall, the various measures uh, put four million free people on an uncertain path towards full citizenship. Well, I'm going to challenge you on that and say that one of the difficulties after the Civil War and one of the difficulties we're still facing is um, the recognition of the need for more than political legal uh, citizenship. That there's a requirement, I would argue that there is a requirement and have argued in um, statements and uh, addresses and uh, some published work that we need, we African Americans need more than political legal citizenship, but also the requirement of economic standing. And that if you don't have both of those simultaneously or being developed, that it's going to be very difficult to establish full citizenship. So what I'm saying is not that I don't want the legal. I'm not saying I, I don't want the economic. I'm saying that we need to conceive of um, a, a way to try to bring the economic standing into being and how to do that in terms of the policy uh, arena 
as well as the political legal standing. Now, we know that we're being challenged at this very day, this very point after the Supreme Court um, term in terms of the legal, in, in terms of the, the voting rights issues uh, and their willingness to substantially weaken the Voting Rights Act with section two, which seemed always the backstop to, um, you know, if, they, if it came to the time when section five was in jeopardy, which I don't think any of us thought would come, but there it is in 2013. And now the court has come down on section two as well. Uh, so I know that that's a problem, but I'm still gonna make the argument that we need to have both the economic and the formal legal dimensions of politics in order to substantially strengthen um, citizenship for African Americans. We need both the political and the economic. So those are my comments. Thank you very much, uh, Vernon and Armand. Very briefly, uh, if you have a response, uh, and then we'll go to Q and A. Yes, I, I'm just respond very briefly. Uh, Diane focused on a very important sentence, and uh, I guess we intended to agree wholeheartedly with you, Diane, that the failure to to make economic progress uh, in the post Civil War times, the failure to to uh, continue with the Freedmen Bureau and the things that they were doing, the failures at land reform, that those really undermined the, uh, uh, the possibility of true freedom. And if our sentence, which I, frankly, we labored over the sentence a lot, and if it mm. ended up perhaps suggesting that economic security was less important um, than political security, then I just wish we'd written the sentence a little differently. I but see. I wholeheartedly agree with your point. Yeah. Economic security, the point we were trying to make was that without economic security, any other security was uncertain. And and we actually discuss uh, the alternatives and how close they came. And it's again, historians like to talk about contingency. People just misread Reconstruction. And what a difference. People forget that the president is a winner take all uh, it's not just in the supreme court and others but even appointing little trial justices down in saint helena island we give it an example that's why people uh on saint helena island were able to keep their land is because it had been justices that uh lincoln had appointed with approval from who mm. suggested by others like salmon chase and that has held up that was the only reason Whereas with Sherman's order, the way it was done, it was, was not. So what I want to point out is so important. That is, if you're not at the table politically, if you don't have that, you can't protect it. And a good example is what we just learned about Tulsa, or rather, I think the public hopefully just learned about Tulsa. Many of us historians knew that, particularly through the great John Hope Franklin's, uh, having grown up there with his father, Buck Franklin. Right. But literally, uh, as African Americans were doing so well there until the white supremacists destroyed it and then to make sure they couldn't do it, went after the laws, changing those laws to be those laws of discrimination that other Southern states, the former Confederates had had. And that was deliberate. And I think you cannot separate out. I made this argument in my PhD thesis that I never published, you know, uh, on ungrateful servants that you cannot separate out that right to vote is so central. That's a central democracy. And when people are able to vote and be at the table, they can affect economic progress. And they did during Reconstruction at that time. And literally that changed, in fact, social and relationships. My great example was a, a Baptist deacon in the Baptist church who marries his former slave on the courthouse square during Reconstruction um, in <laughs> Edgefield County, which I had studied. And I think we don't understand how important the laws are to those economic uh, things. As, as uh, Barbara mentioned, we go through the kind of all the laws that brought affirmative action to white people and denied them with intent to African-Americans. That is 
affirmative action for whites only all those years. Mm-hmm. And it seems to be wanting to go back. A, a, as bad a misuse of the 14th Amendment as could be, because I really believe that amendment was directed because of what was happening to former enslaved, that is black people in America. Uh, and we've let this language issue of power sort of control this. But what I don't want people to do is give up on democracy. I love, I got it in after the book was done. We had a lot of charges we had to pay for because uh, we wanted to get Amy Comey Barrett in after it was in page proofs and other things. So we're still paying uh, for that. But I love on page four, the picture of we have in a third good marshal because he's a role model. Not only a role model, you may not learn lessons from history, but look at what these people struggle with, like Jones taking those three cases from Mississippi there again and again. Well, third good marshal won almost every case against overwhelming odds and his life being threatened. And then he gets appointed to the Supreme Court. And when there, bless his soul, he's on the losing side again and again and again. But he never gave up. And this was a quote I wanted in this book, couldn't figure out where, so I stuck it on the picture and got it in. Thurgood Marshall arrives on the civil media in May 1951 for the school desegregation case of Briggs v. Elliott, the first of five cases that would become Brown v. Board of Education. In the heat of the desegregation battle, Marshall remarked, sometimes I get awfully tired of trying to save the white man's soul. And this picture was taken by a 13 or 14 year old African-American Cecil Williams in South Carolina who goes on to be one of the great photographers of the civil rights movement incidentally. But it's not just Thurgood Marshall, it's too easy to focus on certain people. But there, and that's one of the things we wanted to show the, the Mary Hamilton's and other that were there and they fought that fault and they used the law. And the law did make a difference. And I think that's what we got to do to be positive. Uh, if we do nothing, as I said, the good people who did nothing, then that's where we went, I think, the great flaw for Reconstruction. Diane, even without the, the Sherman's order and that, African-Americans were getting land during Reconstruction. They passed mm-hmm. laws. Uh, they passed a law that if, if you killed a black man, then you taxed all the landowners, meaning mostly whites, to support that family. I mean, when you, Barbara didn't answer, didn't get Armand to answer the question on what we were suggesting on uh, immunity before, uh, with the sort of kind of things that's been happening with George Floyd. But this is what this was. They were to face those same issues after the Civil War, uh, and when blacks were at the table. I can remember my testifying. It wasn't that that uh, white people were deliberately not giving sidewalk sewer service in Mullen, South Carolina, all five of the people lived within like four houses of each other who were on the city council. They just weren't aware until you had somebody sitting at the table with them. It's important. Thank you. We now go to Q&A. We have Jim Banner, who has been very patiently waiting with his hand up uh, for a good while now. Jim, you know the routine, unmute yourself and ask a question. I do, thank you, Eric. Um, Vernon, it's nice to see you again, and Councillor Durfner, it's, it's nice to be with you too. Um, I'm puzzled by one statement that I think, Vernon, um, you made at the start, and um, you cert- I, I have no question, of course, with the moral, the moral fervor of, of both of you and of the book, apparently, which I haven't read, nor do I question anything about getting at motives, which of course historians do uh, differently than attorneys and and justices and judges. But does it do a full justice to the subject if we leave out the effect of all of these voting restrictions on people of all colors, all races, all origins, all places in this country determined by um, wealth and by class, as we would say, and as Vernon, you apparently were sharply criticized for many years ago. Um, in other words, it, it, it seems to me unnecessary to rule out 
class and economic status and so on from the story in order to gain the impact for the rest of the story that you clearly seek and I think it probably achieved. I, I can I agree with everything you said, Jim. And uh, as you know, or maybe don't know, I learned so much from you as one of the great teachers about how to be a historian when you taught at, at Princeton that I, I agree exactly. The point I was trying to make is it should have been the effect. It's the Supreme Court that said you had to show the intent. And it goes back to John uh, uh, Wisdom Minor uh, statement that Barbara said about how the court can deal with class inequities and with um, um, uh, uh, racial inequities. And as you well know, I suspect I was part of the affirmative uh, af af white affirmative action for me to get into Princeton in the first place. All right. Frank. No question. I'll just add this one thing. There's no question that the right to vote is not secure for people who are less educated, who have less money, who work all day, all that sort of thing. And frankly, uh, I think a lot of the focus now has to be on uh, making the right to vote real for everybody, which seemed to be happening in 2020. And part of that, and that's part of the reason that some people want to stop it from happening from now on. Thank you. We have a question in the Q&A uh, from Sonia Michelle, uh, who kind of brings us uh, very much uh, into the current moment. And she asks, would you please explain the relationship between pur pur purpose, intention versus effect and critical race theory. Does a focus on effect not undermine some of the claims of critical race theory? And then she adds, or maybe to put it another way, to what extent does critical race theory explain the legal history that you cover in this book? Uh, if I understand critical race theory, and I'm not, I don't think I do, but my sense of it is simply an awareness that race is at the bottom of a lot of things we thought might not have been about race. Um, and so, uh, for example, in Texas, there seems to be uh, uh, a controversy about whether uh, the Alamo and the effort of Texas to leave Mexico or white Texans to leave Mexico and join the US had anything to do with slavery. Well, a lot of it did have to do with slavery and everybody who has really looked at it knows that. And my understanding is that I guess, and I could be wrong, my understanding is that it, critical race theory is just another way of saying, hey, it was obvious that slavery and Mexico's abolition of slavery were at the heart of white Texans, especially, especially at the Alamo, of trying to get away from Mexico and trying to join the, uh, the slave-ridden uh, United States. Now, if that's critical race theory, um, all they've done is, is to try to put a bad name on something that seems pretty obvious. Um, I guess I would also say, tying it to effect, is when we realize how much race has had to do with so many things in the United States and other countries as well, um, it's part of the national amnesia that we talk about that seems to say race is not involved. And I guess the way to tie effect into it is to recognize that a lot of the ways, a lot of the things that seem to have a racial effect really do have a lot more race underlying it than just um, the, the notion that effect is an accident. Effects are not an accident. And if critical race theory means um, just being aware that race is involved in a lot of things that people would like to say is not involved in, that's just a, a way of, of putting a name on something and, and trying to call it out, or trying to prevent it by putting a bad name on it. Vernon, anything to add there? No, I, I could go on and on, but I think I think it's absolutely true. And the idea that uh, you know, as as uh, Diane or and both Sonia are 
are talking about. It seems that if a law discriminated, and as John Wisdom Miner said, the effect of it discriminates, why do you need to do in Tennessee a way to, to get out of it? And a critical race theory is so much in the, in the news today, we, we'd have to almost do a whole session going back to what Derek Bell intended, I think, when he was saying that, you know, race is part of it and then has been uh, taken on by different groups in different ways. Uh, Let me just tell a quick anecdote. Um, uh, uh, a great scholar named James Lowen wrote a book about Mississippi history um, that was designed to really be a history, whereas the previous books talked about how um, slavery wasn't all that bad, and, you know, people were happy, et cetera. So uh, the Mississippi um, Textbook Board rejected uh, the book called Mississippi Conflict and Change, and it was it, the case went to court, and the state superintendent said that one of the problems they had was that there was a picture of a lynching in um, uh, in the book, and they objected to that. And the judge said, "Well, but didn't lynchings happen?" And the superintendent said, "Well, it was, but it was so long ago." And the judge said, well, this is a history book, isn't it? So the idea of trying to erase things, which we call national amnesia. Um, uh, George Orwell, we, we quote George Orwell in the introduction, and I think it's, it's appropriate here. In 1980, the book 1984, he said, one of the things he said, and this is what we quote, the past was erased, the erasure was forgotten, the lie became the truth. And that's what we risk if we forget or try to erase the past. Thank you. We have a hand up, uh, Stephen Shore. Um, if you would unmute yourself, you may ask a question. Yes, my question is, uh, can, are you, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, isn't it only a matter of time before the Supreme Court allows a state registrar to deny blacks the right to vote out of sincere religious conviction. <laughs> I hope we don't get anyone. That. So, some of the religious, some of the decisions um, recognizing re religious freedom under the First Amendment seems it seems that really, I think, do a, get, put religion in a bad light. They seem to suggest that the main job of the Supreme Court in interpreting the Freedom of Religion Clause is to allow um, religious, allow employers to mistreat employees. Um, yes, I, th I think the Supreme Court has gone way overboard on uh, the Religion Clause, has forgotten what we used to think of when we were growing up as a wall of separation um, between the state and religion. And uh, so I hope we don't get to the point, but to the point you make, but that question is a very serious one these days. One of the uh, things we do in the book, and we try to make the emphasis, because we're talking at the Supreme Court level up here, but what really matters is how it's enforced down at the actual voting or other levels. Does that have to be about voting, could be housing, anything else. And it's always been the last line of defense, particularly in the old Confederacy, the former Confederacy, were the poll watchers and who they got to vote or not. And that's still the issue. I won't go into some of the anecdotes, but after this court case that I testified in for the legal win and vote as a Brennan Center against the South Carolina voter ID law, I was there when they did out the ruling. But then when I went to vote, the poll watchers sort of ignored what the court had decided. It was, uh, it was interesting. So that does relate to how important at every level this is. While we're writing about what the Supreme Court did is how it's enacted at the local levels that really affects people's lives dramatically. Thank you. Um, we had a question uh, in the chat um, that uh, uh, Diane just answered um, uh, in the chat, uh, listing the books uh, that she mentioned. So for those of you who are interested, uh, you can find that list of uh, authors and books right there. Uh, I am afraid, alas, we are 
out of time. Uh, and I think we could probably go on for much of the evening um, if we had the Zoom room reserved and, and people would cancel their other plans. Uh, but in fact, we don't. Um, so uh, I simply want to say my thanks to Barbara, Diane, Armand, and Vernon uh, for this terrific conversation. Uh, we've only been able to scratch the surface uh, of what is both a very readable uh, and very informative and important book. Uh, and given what is going on in the country uh, at uh, this moment in the last number of years, uh, I think it's all the more important that the things that you write about um, uh, get read. Uh, and I would recommend uh, this book uh, to whoever would want to read it. Uh, it's very important. Uh, and with that, I'm going to turn the Zoom room back to Christian for final remarks. Sir, it's yours. Thanks, Eric. Um, again, please join us next week, uh, July 12th, for discussion of Kai Bird's The Outlier, The Unfinished Presidency of Jimmy Carter. Uh, thanks again to Vernon, Armand, Barbara, Diane, of course, Eric, for what was just a, a riveting, a really engaged, a really meaningful and relevant conversation this afternoon. I'm so grateful to all of you. Thanks to our audience for watching and participating. We're adjourned. Stay safe and good night.